Yes. Let's go through chapter seven now, dental anomalies. What is an anomaly? It's defined as something that deviates from ordinary or normal. Dental anomalies are derived from the dental tissues, enamel, dentin, as well as cementum. And anomalies can be extreme variations or just slight variations. And they can be caused from very uh, many things and not just by one small variation uh, in the environment necessarily, but it can be. I mean, it's amazing what just a little fever during uh, tooth calcification can do. So it's these changes in variation and normal that we want you to notice, not only in teeth, but this is what we're doing when we're doing our EOIO, our oral cancer exam on every patient, every time. We're looking for normal and deviations from normal. So some abnormalities result from intrinsic factors, okay, happening within, such as hereditary metabolic dysfunction or mutations or other causes. Um, that can be extrinsic, such as physical or chemical trauma, biologic agents, <coughs> nutritional deficiencies, stress, habits, or environmental conditions. And in many instances, anomalies result from a combination of both intrinsic and extrinsic factors. So if a condition occurs due to genetics, it is termed hereditary. <coughs> excuse me, if it exhibits some evidence of being inherited, but the evidence is inconclusive, then it's referred to as a familial tendency. The missing laterals, permanent laterals, is a familial tendency. If a condition occurs at or before birth, it's termed congenital. If a condition results during development, it's referred to as a developmental anomaly. So say the child had a high fever and it interrupted the calcification process before the tooth erupted <coughs> or when it was being formed and calcified, then that would be a developmental anomaly, not something that's hereditary or congenital. Some anomalies result in variation of size. You can have something called macrodontia, which is when the teeth appear very large, or microdontia, when the teeth appear very small. Anomalies resulting in the variation in the number of teeth, hyperdontia, multiple or extra teeth, versus anodontia, which is too few teeth. Anodontia is when you have congenitally missing teeth, not when teeth have been removed. So partial anodontia would be, uh, say, the uh, number seven and 10 never formed. That's partial anodontia. The third molars, your wisdom teeth never formed. Partial anodontia versus true anodontia is when you have no teeth that have formed. And you can see the extra teeth on top for hyper and the anodontia on the bottom. Partial anodontia. Total anodontia exists when no teeth are present. Partial anodontia is if less than the normal number of teeth are present. So true anodontia is a congenital absence of teeth. It may involve the permanent dentition, the primary dentition, or both. If primary teeth are congenitally missing, their permanent replacements will also be absent. And that's the takeaway on this slide. If the primary teeth are congenitally missing, so will their permanent counterparts. And know the difference between partial anodontia and true anodontia. The most commonly missing permanent teeth are your third molars, the wisdom teeth. 
The maxillary wisdom teeth are more often missing than the mandibular wisdom teeth. The next most likely teeth to be missing are the permanent maxillary lateral incisors. Then the third most common missing tooth are the mandibular second premolars. The least likely permanent teeth to be missing are the canines. So our maxillary third molars are the first, then the laterals, maxillary laterals, and then the permanent mandibular second premolars. Hyperdontia occurs when there are extra or supernumerary teeth. Supernumerary teeth are the most commonly located at the midline and the molar regions. Maxillary supernumerary teeth outnumber mandibular nine to one. So it's all you need to know is it's more common to have extra supernumerary teeth on the maxilla than on the mandible. And we have to have special names for things. So if you have a tooth, an extra tooth at the midline, it's called a mesiodens. A mesiodens are the most common supernumerary tooth. So when we were talking first, second, and third, these are the uh, missing teeth, the third molars, the lateral incisors and the second premolars. Now we're talking about the extra teeth, mesiodens, when it occurs in the midline. There are fourth molars, also called distomolars, are located distal to the third molars and are the next most common supernumerary teeth. Maxillary distomolars are for, far more common than mandibular because remember, maxillary supernumerary teeth outnumber those of the mandibular. So we've got our distomolar followed by supernumerary teeth in the premolar area of the mandible. And then supernumerary teeth is situated buccally or lingually to the molar is called a paramolar. It's usually smaller and rudimentary. So a fourth molar are located distal to the third molars versus a paramolar is next to buccally or lingually. If a supernumerary tooth resembles a regular tooth, it's called a supplemental tooth. If it's cone-shaped, it's called conical. And if it's very small, it's called a tubercle. So they've got names for these to describe them. Supernumerary teeth are much more common in the permanent dentition than in the primary dentition. We're talking anomalies and odontoma is a tumor, a growth anomaly of calcified dental tissues. It looks like a tooth. You can have complex or compound. The complex consists of a single mass of tooth-like structures. It's a blob and, and unspecified shape, it's just a blob, versus a compound consists of several small masses that more or less resemble rudimentary teeth. So a complex is one blob, a compound is more than one blob, but it looks like a tooth. Then you have this dens and dente, which we've seen in slides before. It means tooth within a tooth. That permanent maxillary lateral are the most commonly affected by dens and dente. It's a developmental variation thought to occur when that outer surface of the crown engulfs itself. Tooth within a tooth. Dens and dente 
most common on the maxillary lateral. See it radiographically. Dilaceration is a sharp bend or curve, okay? Sharp bend or curve. Dwarfed roots, condition where the roots of the teeth are extremely short in comparison to their crowns. So when you're taking radiographs, is this foreshortening? Is it because of your vertical angulation? Is it from orthodontic movement where the roots resorbed because the teeth were moved too quickly? Or is it dwarfed roots? And that's where having accurate radiographs come in. So you can compare. Gemination or twinning is the developmental anomaly that arises when a tooth attempts to divide itself or partially twin itself by splitting its tooth germ. Gemination. It's a result in twin teeth, but in most cases, geminated teeth are only partially split. They usually have a single root with a common pulp canal, single root and a bifurcated crown. Twinning or gemination is more commonly seen in the anterior area of primary dentition, anterior area of primary dentition for gemination. Versus fusion occurs when two adjacent tooth germs unite. Misty? You're going to need a radiograph for this one. Yes. If germination would be present on, on primary teeth, then they would be present on permanent also? Yes, yes. but it's okay. more common in primary. Okay. Fusion, two adjacent tooth germs unite. So you've got two teeth that have been united along part of or all of the entire length of the tooth. So they may have crowns that are joined or roots that are joined. If the teeth are only connected by the cementum, there's another name for that, and it's called concrescence, it's not fusion. When the cementum of one tooth is connected to the cementum of another, it's called concrescence. fusion. The crowns are connected as well, not just the roots. Third molar, supernumerary, paramolar. Paramolar is usually not distal to a third molar. usually on the buccal or the lingual, but this is fused to the third molar. Concrescence is a type of fusion that occurs where only the roots are fused. Concrescence is thought to occur as a result of trauma It's most often seen in the maxillary molar region. Again, only the cementum, the roots are fused. Then you've got, we're talking anomalies in shape, hyper cementosis, excess deposits of cementum, usually occurs at the apex of the tooth and often along the entire root of the tooth. Why would it occur at the apex more often? Remember your cellular and acellular cementum? Where is that cellular cementum? The apical third of the root. Cementoma is a form of hypercementosis 
but it's associated with the destruction of bone. Hypersementosis does not destroy bone, but a cementoma does. Enamel pearls. Small masses of excess enamel often found in the bifurcation or trifurcation. Enamel pearls are most common on the maxillary molars. Can you have periodontal ligament attachment around an enamel pearl? No. No. <laughs> Say it with, with conviction. No. Hutchinson's incisors. We've seen this in a couple of, of different pictures. They're notched incisors, sometimes called screwdrivers. Okay, shaped, and they are formed as a result of prenatal or congenital syphilis. Enamel dysplasia, dys, something went wrong. It's not regular with dys, D-Y-S. Okay, enamel dysplasia includes two types of abnormal enamel development, either enamel hypoplasia or enamel hypocalcification. Enamel hypoplasia is caused by any condition that inhibits enamel formation. It can be caused by inflammation, fever, systemic disease. It can even be hereditary versus enamel hypocalcification is caused by a condition that inhibits the calcification of enamel. So hypoplasia inhibits enamel formation, hypocalcification in, uh, inhibits calcification. Fluorosis can be mild to severe. They have gauges for this. They have indexes for this as well. It causes hypocalcification due to an excessive amount of fluoride. It can appear as small white spot lesions or dark and brown. It can sometimes have brownish spots and pits in it. When it's really severe, it's called mottled enamel. This is not mottled enamel. This is something different. Amelogenesis imperfecta. Amelogenesis imperfecta. Take the word apart. is a developmental anomaly related to hypocalcification. They've got no enamel. Amelogenesis imper imperfecta. In a typical form of amelogenesis imperfecta, the enamel of the permanent and deciduous teeth are both affected. Sometimes only the permanent teeth are affected though. So that's contradictory right there. But the enamel, when it's present, is very thin and stained in various shades of yellow and brown. And with an amelogenesis imperfecta, it will fracture away. So only the dentin is exposed. A Turner's tooth, hypocalcification of a single tooth. The condition occurs if a, developing, if a developing permanent tooth is affected by a localized trauma or in, infection. It's just one tooth, Turner's tooth. Dentinogenesis imperfecta. We had the amelogenesis imperfecta where they had no enamel. Dentinogenesis imperfecta is a hereditary dentinal developmental abnormality. The dentin is 
colored gray, brown, or yellow, but the tooth exhibits an unusual translucent hue. So the pulp chambers and root canals are completely filled with dentin. And it occurs because the dentinal tissue continues to form dentin until that root canal and pulp chamber is completely filled. Dentinogenesis imperfecta, too much dentin. And this is what they look like. Where is the pulp chamber here? They're also called opalescent teeth because of the bluish hue. Dentinogenesis imperfecta. Don't even need a color picture for that one. No pulp chambers. Tetracycline staining can have uh, be in permanent as well as deciduous teeth. We're not seeing this hardly at all anymore because we now know what the cause is and the doctors, the pediatricians are not prescribing the cyclines during tooth formation. We've talked about this a little bit. occurs when an expectant mother or young child with the tooth crown still forming are given an, uh, the antibiotic tetracycline. Crown shapes, lots of different shapes. All right, so the most common malformed anterior tooth is the maxillary lateral. And that's going to be peg-shaped. What is the most common missing anterior tooth? It's also the maxillary lateral, right? It's the lateral, yeah. It was kind of a trick question because it would be a third molar, but anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, as well. But the maxillary lateral, yeah, if you don't know. Then the mandibular second premolars vary from the two to three cusp form with several variations of each. Accessory cusps or tubercles can occur on any tooth, but it's most commonly found on maxillary molars. So we've got our lateral incisors, maxillary laterals, our mandibular second premolars. And guess what? That is one of the most common um, teeth that are not formed. The maxillary central premolars usually have one root, but may have two. Abnormal root formation. Sometimes the second premolars can be bifurcated. The maxillary first premolars are usually bifurcated, but may have one. They may even have three for these first premolars. The maxillary second premolars or canines may have accessory roots. So you might see a mandibular, excuse me, a mandibular second premolar that's got two roots or a mandibular canine might have two roots. Mandibular canines and premolars are usually single rooted but might have accessory roots. Third molars are the most likely multi-rooted teeth to possess accessory roots, third molars. So we're talking root formation. Remember that dilaceration, okay? Dilaceration is a sharp bend. It's more than 40 degrees. Otherwise, it's just called flexion. Flexion is a slight bend. Dilaceration is a, a sharp bend. Maxillary teeth with normal sized crowns and abnormally short roots are not very common. You can have excessive cementum formation. Remember that hypercementosis on a radiograph versus odontoma that destroys roots. Total odontia versus partial odontia. Remember the difference? Partial odontia. Maxillary third molars are commonly missing, then the maxillary laterals. 
than the mandibular second premolars. We're reviewing very quickly. Maxillary third molars, most commonly missing. So they've got one third molar on the right side and not on the left. Second most commonly missing are the maxillary lateral incisors. Years ago, what, what they would do orthodontically was they'd move the um, canines into the lateral space. And then what they would do is they'd shave off or shape the uh, canine, they'd reshape it to make it appear more like a lateral. Now what they do, if we know, they maintain the space and when the person's old enough, they'll get implants. Second premolar is the third most common missing tooth. So this is why when we're in private practice, we want to go from a size one sensor to a size two sensor as soon as the child can um, tolerate it because this is what we're looking for here. Now, are we going to do anything about it? No, but what we're gonna do is advise the parent that they're missing a tooth. They're going to try and retain this tooth as long as possible until eventually there's going to be root resorption that's going to occur eventually. Uh, my best friend's daughter at the age of 40 just lost her last second molar. And she's got, um, she's going to be getting ready for an implant. So we don't know how long those teeth last. Other missing teeth, they happen. So like I said, the first thing I do is I count teeth. And it's usually the mandibular that gets me messed up before I start my probing. There should be six of them. And there's only five. Same way here, there should be four teeth in the deciduous and there's only three. What tooth do you think is missing over here on A? The right lateral incisor? That's what I would say, because it's a little bit larger than the central. Mm -hmm. Extra teeth. If it's between tooth number eight and nine, what's it called? A mesiodens. Third molar area. supernumerary or paramolar if it's on more on the buccal and the lingual and then the mandibular premolar area come in all sorts of different shapes and sizes so this particular model has three central incisors, but only one lateral. Mesiodens. Isn't that cute? Paramolar or fourth molar. You'll have patients saying they had all four of their wisdom teeth extracted. And then you take another pan and guess what? They got another one in there. Mandibular premolars. This is a periodontal nightmare. How are you going to floss? How are you going to clean? So if you're going to have an extra tooth, it's better to have them in alignment, obviously. 
extra, mandibular, central, incisor. So you've got canine and canine. What is this called? Okay, sharp bend is dilaceration. Slight bend is uh, flexion. Extra tooth, is it connected by just the uh, root or is the whole tooth connected? Is it a paramolar, supernumerary, pig-shaped lateral, pig-shaped maxillary canines? When you see patients like this, there's also usually other congenital um, disorders going. This is very typical of um, ectodermal dysplasia. You're going to learn about this in pathology. You know, they usually have multiple things going on. Fusion, two crowns, or uh, two roots, versus twinning has one root. Showing you different things. Hutchinson's incisor. Remember those screwdriver incisors? Now, don't make the assumption just because the patient's coming in like this, that they had congenital syphilis. Sometimes it's the way the tooth forms, and it could be uh, from the one and then the, the two and the three lobes. Sometimes they could be um, doing something to cause that type of notching. It could be attrition of some sort or abrasion. Extra tubercles and ridges, very lumpy. This is not a cingulum. This is actually a tubercle. Prominent ridges. The problem with this, and there really isn't a problem though, but this could develop some stain because the toothbrush isn't giving adequate friction. Extra cusps. Again, periodontal nightmares. Remember the tuberculum intermedium, tuberculum sexton, Tuberculum intermedium is when it's in the center of the tooth and sextum is when it's not. Enamel pearls, oftentimes in maxillary molars, pathifurcation, most common in maxillary over mandibular. Torodontia or prism tooth, you'll see radiographically. Talon cusps. This has a name to it. Look at this. Look how huge this is. It's an extralingual cusp. Huge. That's on, when it's on an anterior tooth, it's called a talon cusp. Variations in size. And shape. Shovel shaped and double shovel shaped. Look at these marginal ridges, very pronounced. I've never seen this, but all the books have it. Double shovel shaped. Dilaceration versus flexion. Dens and dente. 
tooth within a tooth. What tooth is usually associated with this? Maxillary, oh, maxillary lateral. lateral. Maxillary lateral. Concrescence, joining it just the cementum. Dwarfed roots or abnormally long roots. Hypercementosis, thickening with no bone loss. Odontoma is associated with bone loss. Extra roots. First, this is a mandibular molar. Extra roots. Bifurcation, extra roots. Mandibular canines will have them over maxillary canines. And isn't this cute? This is a premolar, a bifurcated mandibular premolar. Extra roots. This is a premolar. Look at this. Premolar that's trifurcated. Maxillary first, <clears throat> premolar. Anomalies in position. Teeth can be switched around. The problem with this is how do you do this on the computer? It's much easier to mark things down when you have a paper chart. You've seen this picture before. This is a completely rotated second premolar. Completely rotated. This is the buckle, the lingual. Again, when you see mouth after mouth after mouth, this is going to stick out. Boy, is it going to stick out to you. Amelogenesis imperfecta, faulty enamel production. Sometimes you don't have it at all. Fluorosis, mild to severe. Enamel damage or dysplasia due to high fever. What you want to do is you want to look at, okay, these two teeth look a little funky. Then you go over to the other side and see if it's bilateral because this way you can say, oh, here and here, you must have had a high fever or something going on because during tooth formation, something was happening. Hypo, enamel hypoplasia. Turner's tooth from localized trauma. This little pit. Focal enamel hypoplasia. Attrition, abrasion, erosion. Attrition, tooth to tooth, abrasion. Something is rubbing against it and erosion is chemical. Tooth to tooth. Abrasion, That's, what is this patient doing? Using some sort of a scrub brush. That's a toothbrush versus, whoops, versus tobacco, chewing, that wears teeth down. Erosion, is it from coming from the throat and coming out the mouth this way? If it is, then you're seeing all of this lingual erosion or are they sucking on something? Where is the erosion happening? Patients are oftentimes unaware that they have these, this lingual erosion. If they could be bulimic, they could have GERD where they're kind of erping a little bit. 
uh, in their sleep and they don't know that they don't realize that their stomach acids are coming up into their mouth. Unusual dentition. Just go back and take a look at this. Okay, so you had had most of that before. Just a couple new terms. And I'm sorry I kept you over, but this way we've got, uh, we, we covered next week's chapter as well. Miss D? Yeah. So um, are we, I think we have an exam next week. Are we getting tested on the anomalies as well? No. Okay. Do you want to be? No. <laughs> I'll be, I'll be glad to do it if you like. No, it's okay. <laughs> okay, no, no, no. Um, the nice thing about this course, and, and this is me, very methodical. You've got the same amount of, of chapters on each test and the same amount of questions from each chapter. I love it. This is how my mind works. Misty, so um, these two chapters that you um, went over today is not going to be on the exam next week. No, uh, anomalies is not going to be on the exam, but primary and mixed dentition is. Oh, okay. So canines, premolars, molars. Let's see, canines, premolars, molars, and primary and dentition. Um, yeah, that. Four chapters. Any other questions? Remember tomorrow I'm gonna, uh, I'll set up a Zoom uh, and tomorrow at 1030, you'll meet with the Procter & Gamble rep and get your free, hopefully the brushes will be there on Monday when we get there. So you'll be able to reap the rewards of that. Okay, everybody, that's it. If there's no other questions, Bye-bye.